In this video, we get to acceleration in two and three dimensions. Again, the acceleration is defined exactly the same way, and it's the only thing you really have to remember. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So we start with a position as a function of time where each of the components, x and y, are functions with respect to time, and we put that in vector form using component notation. If we have a third dimension, that just adds a third term along the z-axis, but for simplicity, we'll just work with two. We know that the velocity is the derivative of the position, so if we take that derivative, we have a velocity vector function where the components are the x component of the velocity that can vary with respect to time and the y component of the velocity. So the acceleration is the time derivative of that velocity vector. Since the differentiation is distributive, I can bring the derivative to each term, and so I take the derivative of the x component of the velocity, and I take the derivative of the y component of the velocity. The i hat and j hat vectors are constant, so you just treat them as constants, like you would with any differentiation. You do have to keep them separate, because you can't mix the different components. That will give us the x component and the y components of the acceleration, which themselves may vary with respect to time. Previously, we had a position vector that looked like this. By differentiating that, we found the velocity vector. And in this case, the x component was a constant to i hat, while the y component still varied with respect to time. If we differentiate that to find the acceleration vector, we're just left with negative 10 j hat. The derivative of 2i hat, both of those are constant, so the derivative of a constant is zero. The derivative of nine halves is also zero. The derivative of negative 10 t is just negative 10, and that gives us the acceleration. Well, that's easy enough, but let's connect it back to the real event where this was coming from, which was the trajectory of a ball being thrown. Let's quickly watch that again. Before, we had created a motion diagram of that motion. We took every other frame about 1 15th of a second apart, and then identified the position of the ball to the best we can with a purple dot. To quantify that motion, we had to establish a coordinate system, which we included the origin at the first dot. We limited ourselves to frames where the ball was in the air, and not being touched by a different object. It had left my hand by this point and it had not yet hit the ground. That gives us a clean picture of our motion diagram. Those are our position vectors that showed us how the position was changing as a function of time. From those, we calculated the average velocity. Now the average velocity has units of meters per second, but the relative sizes of those arrows directly correspond to the relative sizes of the average velocities. Now we want to calculate the average acceleration. Well, the average acceleration comes from velocity differences between successive average velocities, then divided by the total time. As long as we keep everything a relative scale, we should be fine, and so we're just going to calculate the velocity differences. The velocity differences is going to be the final velocity minus the initial velocity for successive average velocity vectors. Let's look at the first set. The initial velocity will be the first one, and the final velocity will be the second one, and I've taken their difference here. In trying to do this accurately, I actually copied and pasted each of these vectors, so I'm not faking any of the simulation or calculation for this example. So I took the final velocity and copied and pasted it here, and I took the initial velocity, the average velocity, I flipped at 180 degrees, which is negative v sub i, and now I'm adding them graphically using the tail to tip method. The resulting vector is the average acceleration, which is given by that orange vector. I've gone ahead and put a copy of that acceleration vector to point that that's the average acceleration between those two velocity vectors. Let's look at the next one. I literally copied and pasted each of these vectors over here. I flipped the initial one 180 degrees and I added them by the tail and tip method, drew a new orange arrow, 
as the resulting vector, which is the average acceleration for the next two velocity vectors. I literally did that for every pair of velocity vectors, but I won't make you sit through them all. But I've placed every one that I calculated next to the dot between the pairs of average velocity vectors from which I calculated that average acceleration graphically. Let's compare them all together for a moment. And here's a set of them all side by side. Well, they're not all pointing in exactly the same direction, but that's just a function of how well we can take their data, and it was probably pretty rough. I would say the main source of uncertainty is where I placed the dots on the original picture. But if you look at that, every acceleration vector is pointing downward, and they're all about the same size which is exactly what we expected given our calculation, a constant acceleration pointing downward. Despite there being a somewhat complicated trajectory, the ball was moving forward the whole time, the acceleration was constant and downward, dominated just by the acceleration due to gravity.